In this video, I will cover step 7, which is the actual termination step, and step 8, where we will discuss the recycling of RNA polymerase 2. Just a quick recap on the structure of a gene, we have the promoter of a gene, a 5' untranslated region, UTR, of the gene, which starts with the transcription start site. UTRs are just part of the genes that are transcribed into the RNA, but are not used to make proteins. At the end of the 5' UTR, you can find the start of the coding region, which marks the start of the first exon. And in mammalian genome, a gene can have multiple exons that are spread out. In between these exons, you may find non-coding regions, known as introns. At the end of the coding region of the final exon, you have the 3' untranslated region. Okay, so linking this back to transcription, we have seen that promoters mark the beginning of transcription. By recruiting RNA polymerase 2 through a host of general transcription factors. Again, the links for all these videos are in the description if you want to check them out. After initiation, the RNA polymerase moves along the gene in a stage called elongation, and this is what we have covered so far. After elongation, the RNA polymerase has finished transcribing the RNA. The polymerase reaches the 3' UTR, and that's where the RNA polymerase needs to exit the DNA and stop transcription. Okay, so let's start. In this specific video, we will only talk about RNA polymerase 2 as we have been discussing so far, which also means that we are restricting our discussion to the termination of mRNAs, which are the protein coding RNAs, and some non coding RNAs and small nuclear RNAs. And these are the RNAs which are transcribed by the RNA polymerase 2 in the mammalian cells. Eukaryotic transcription termination has historically been studied in yeast as a model system. And then later these studies were translated to humans. But there are some differences that do not translate so well from yeast to humans, for obvious reasons. In yeast, for example, we have two predominant pathways for RNA polymerase 2 transcription termination. The first one is the CPF-CF pathway, which terminates mRNA. The second one is the NNS-dependent pathway, which is responsible for the termination of non-coding RNA, small nuclear RNAs, or small nuclear RNAs. In humans, on the other hand, we have CPSF pathway, which is similar to the CPF-CF pathway in the yeast. And then we have a different pathway known as the integrator-dependent pathway which terminates the non-coding RNAs and the small nuclear RNAs. And this integrator complex dependent pathway is not present in yeast. So you do not have any yeast homologs or analogs for this particular pathway. In this video, we will specifically talk only about the human RNA polymerase 2 dependent transcription termination and not the yeast. So we will discuss the CPSF and the integrator dependent termination pathways of transcription. Okay, so let's discuss the CPSF-dependent transcription termination first. This pathway has three specific proteins that are involved in the process. The first is the CPSF, which stands for cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor. The second is the CSTF, which is the cleavage stimulatory factor. And the third is a group of cleavage factors 1 and 2. So just to reorient ourselves, the termination occurs when the elongating polymerase reaches the 3' UTR of a gene. So there must be something very important in the 3' UTR of a gene that signals the RNA polymerase to terminate transcription. And indeed, there is a signal. Let's see what that is. For simplicity, I will only sketch out the end part of a gene where you have the exon followed by the 3' UTR. For CPF pathways and mRNA specifically, the 3' UTR carries a specific signal known as the polyadenylation signal, or the poly-A signal. So when the moving RNA polymerase with its serine 2 and serine 7 phosphorylated in the C-terminal domain transcribes the poly-A signal, the poly-A signal becomes part of this newly synthesized RNA. 
The polymerase still, at this point, keeps moving forward, but somehow it needs to be stopped. We will see in a moment how this happens. Now for simplicity, I will write down polyadenylation signal as PA. So what is this poly-A signal? If we look into the sequence of these genes in the 3' UTR, we see that it is a 6 to 8 nucleotide long sequence, which is usually AAU, AAA, or some variation of this particular signal. One of these sort of sequences, or multiple of them spread out in the 3' UTR, is what makes a poly-A signal. And it needs to be present in the RNA for the CPSF-dependent pathways to start the termination process. So transcription of poly-A signal is the first step. The overall steps that follow after the poly-A signal is transcribed are described through a mechanism that involves the formation of R loops and a torpedo model. These two terms will become clear in a short while. Okay, so one thing to note is that in the process of termination, we also see that the threonine at position 4 in the C-terminal domain also gets phosphorylated. Now we have serine 2, serine 7, and threonine at 4 phosphorylated. The mechanism and exact time when it occurs is unclear, but we know that it occurs when the RNA polymerase has transcribed the poly-A signal, or at least transcribed some part of the 3' UTR. Once the poly-A signal is transcribed, meaning that it is present now in the RNA, it is recognized by proteins that we talked about just now. So the CSTF and the CPSF bind directly to the poly-A signal and recruit the other factors, which are cleavage factor 1 and cleavage factor 2. So essentially, what we're saying is that the CSTF and CPSF bind the mRNA, and on top of that, they recognize the modifications in the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase 2. Specifically, the CSTF and cleavage factors recognize the serine 2 phosphate of the C-terminal domain. Once this complex of CPSF, CSTF, and cleavage factor 1 and 2 assemble at the poly-A signal, they attack the downstream side of the RNA and cleave it. Once the mRNA is cleaved, the mRNA is released from the transcribing RNA polymerase. So to fill in the gaps, the CSTF and CPSF, after binding the poly-A signal, along with other proteins, their catalytic activity is activated and they cut the mRNA. Now this complex of mRNA, which is cleaved with its bound factors, CPSF, CSTF, and cleavage factors, is ready to be processed and then exported to the nuclei. The CSTF and CPSF are also involved in the processing of RNA, specifically by recruiting the polyadenylation proteins and enzymes that add the poly-A signal to the mRNA and complete its 3' end processing. That's all good for the mRNA, but the termination is not over yet because the RNA polymerase is still moving along the DNA. The mRNA may be cut out, but the polymerase has to be stopped. Otherwise, it is a waste of cells' energy. So how do cells stop this polymerase then? Now, zooming into the catalytic core of the polymerase, we know that there is a transcription bubble at the core of it, where the exiting DNA remains unbound for a stretch of space at the trailing end of the RNA polymerase. Now, the tiny bit of RNA that is left behind after the cleavage and the newly synthesized RNA which is formed in the 3' UTR has the tendency to bind to the unbound DNA. And it forms this RNA-DNA hybrid outside of the transcription bubble. This complex of RNA-DNA hybrid is what we call R-loops. The R-loops are stable enough to pause the movement of RNA polymerase. Once this RNA loop is formed, a protein called SETX recognizes and binds the R-loop structures. SETX can resolve the RNA-DNA hybrid structures, and therefore the R-loops. While resolving the R-loop structures, it recruits an enzyme called XRN2 to the RNA. The enzyme XRN2, after recognizing the RNA, starts eating this RNA until it hits the moving RNA polymerase. When it hits the RNA polymerase, it destabilizes the polymerase from the DNA. And this causes it to disassemble and terminate the transcription. 
XRN2 is basically a 5' prime to 3' prime exoribonuclease. And this sort of release from kicking the polymerase out because XRN2 moves along the RNA is called the torpedo model of termination. And that sums up the first major pathway in transcription termination. Now let's look at the second pathway of termination, which is the integrator-dependent termination pathway. As seen before, this involves non-coding RNAs, small nuclear RNAs, or small nuclear RNAs that still depend on RNA polymerase II for transcription, but they are all non-protein coding in function. Now we can draw the moving RNA polymerase and the structure of these genes. And just as we saw previously, the C-terminal domain has its S2, S7, and T4 phosphorylated, and the polymerase now also must encounter a specific signal that should halt its movement. In the non-coding transcripts, like non-coding RNAs and small nuclear RNAs, this signal that is encoded into the transcript is called the 3' box signal. And notice that this is also present in the 3' UTR part of the gene. Although saying that it is an untranslated region in a non-coding transcript is sort of pointless. But it is just a syntax term in this particular case. Anyways, unlike poly A signal, the 3' box signal tends to be a little longer, around 13 to 16 nucleotides in length. If you care about the sequence composition, they're largely A and T rich, with some variation. An interesting thing about these non-coding transcripts is that they're associated at the 5' end with proteins known as cap binding complexes, and it's associated factors like ASR2. Anyways, when the 3' box signal is transcribed, these special proteins known as integrator proteins, specifically integrator 9 and integrator 11, bind to the 3' box signal in the RNA. This is very similar to the CPF and the CSTF proteins that we have seen before. Now let's complete the picture of this step. Once the integrator complex is bound to the 3' box signal in the RNA, it recruits a bunch of proteins, and primarily a protein known as NELF, which is the negative elongation factor. We have seen NELF in the promoter proximal pausing stage when we discussed initiation and elongation. After this assembly, the integrator complex cuts the RNA in the upstream direction, and the RNA with its cap binding complexes and ASR2 is released away for 3' end processing and the export. Notice that this cutting behavior is slightly different from CPSF pathway. In CPSF pathway, the mRNA was cut in the downstream direction, such that the poly A signal was retained in the mRNA. Here, the 3' box signal is removed from the RNA because the cut is made in the upstream direction. And now the integrator and the NELF complex remain bound with the 3' box signal and therefore are in close proximity to the moving RNA polymerase II. After the RNA is cut, the integrator complexes and its proteins associate with the C-terminal domain and cause a conformational change in the RNA polymerase. Likewise, as we have seen before, the negative elongation factor also causes a conformational change in the polymerase, which causes the RNA polymerase to disassemble from the DNA and terminate the transcription. This sort of model of transcription termination is known as the conformational distortion model. But I do have to point out that the very details of the underlying mechanism of this distortion are still not clearly understood. Okay, so that sort of completes the two pathways of termination of transcription, which is the step 7. This brings us to the last step of termination, which involves the recycling of the RNA polymerase. So what we notice after completion of the termination is that the DNA is left alone, the RNA is released, and the RNA polymerase is released, but its C-terminal domains are still phosphorylated at multiple positions. Now there are two ways to recycle RNA polymerase. One is to put it back on the DNA, or retain it on the DNA after termination by some specific factors, like PC4 and 
TF2H. And these factors, through some long-range interaction, can loop to the promoter and reassemble the polymerase to the promoter to restart transcription of the same gene. That's one way of recycling the RNA polymerase. The second way is via dephosphorylation of the phosphates at serine 2, serine 7, or threonine 4 through proteins or enzymes such as FCP1 and SCP1. And there are a bunch of others. And this now starts to create a pool of fresh RNA polymerases with no C-terminal domain modifications to which the TF2F can bind and take them away to any promoter to initiate transcription. Maintaining this sort of pool of fresh RNA polymerases is perhaps the most common way of recycling RNA polymerase. And that sums up the recycling step. Now before I end this video, I wanted to say that in yeast, we've said that there are two major pathways, like the CPSF, CF, and the NNS pathway. But there are very specific transcripts that utilize cut sites, SUT sites, RUT sites, and XUT sites that are terminated by specific proteins and complexes. But in the case of humans, there are very few of these extra sites, and that most of the termination of RNA polymerase 2 is done by CPSF and integrator pathways that we have just discussed in this video. I just wanted you to keep that in mind for a note. And that wraps up this video.